There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is Happy to, is my mic not on? Is it? I think it's on. I, th I, I got the green light. Okay, we're good. All right, we're actually going to get going right away with our children's message for this morning. I invite all the young ones to come on down. You can grab a seat right over here on the steps. That way we can get you out of here and get you on to Sunday school class. This will be a lot of fun. All right, tell them, get, get sitting down over here. Hello, children. Does anybody know who I am? I'm a king from the Old Testament. Oh, that'll come later. How did you see that? <laughs> that will come later. <laughs> oh, don't pay attention to the baby. Does anybody know who I may be? I have the purple. No, Old Testament, Old Testament. A very wise king. King Solomon, yes. Have you heard of King Solomon the Magnificent? Tis I. I am here with you today to share with you. Actually, I want to grab a seat while we come here. I am King Solomon. 
I am the wisest king that has ever lived. God asked me one day, what would you like to have as the king? And I said, make me the wisest one who has ever lived on this planet. And that's what God made me with a discerning mind, with intelligence beyond compare. And that is why I am here with you this morning to show you the wisdom that I hold. Now I need two volunteers. One, two. Okay, now, you are two mothers and you're disputing because you both say that this is your child. Now come stand up here. So one of you is the real mother. One of you is the real mother and one is trying to steal the baby. And you've come to Solomon the Magnificent to decide the fate of this little child. Now what have you to say for yourselves? Whose baby is it? Does anybody know? Whose baby is there this morning? I have a test. I know what we shall do. We shall cut the baby in half, and then we can give one to each of you. One half to each of you. How does that sound? OK, she said no first. She must be the mother, because she would never want her baby to be cut into half. And you can keep your baby. OK, go sit down here. Very good job, very good job. Solomon is so wise. Solomon is so magnificent. He is the wisest king that has ever lived. He said things like, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Ooh, very wise, wouldn't you say? So wise, incredibly wise, King Solomon. Now I will give you all an opportunity this morning. You can ask the king any question you would like, and the king will answer. Who would like to ask a question of the king? Okay. She said, I don't want to cut the baby in half. Yes, that's what Yaretsi said. That's how I knew she was the mother. You have a question for the king? You, oh, you're blocking the light. Yes. Shadows. Shadows are important. You have a question for the king. Why are you wearing birds? Wearing what? You're wearing birds. Burns? Birds. I'm wearing birds? Birds. Oh, oh, it's because bird. Solomon loves all the animals of the world, and the animals love King Solomon. But then how did they get there? Yeah. How did they get on your clothes? It's just cloth, it's just a design. <laughs> like, give me back this microphone. Who has a question for the king? The king shall answer all questions. You have another question? And I have a puppet. You have a puppet? Oh, Isla has a puppet? That is a wonderful puppet, and puppets are good when you need something to do with your hands. King Solomon knows all, knows all. <laughs> Who has a question for the king? How about out here? We have any questions for King Solomon? Tough crowd today. Oh, our council president has a question. Okay. This is gonna be tough. What is the number for pi? The number for pi, <laughs> the number for pi, is eight because eight slices of pie is the perfect amount of pie to share with your friends. King Solomon knows all. King Solomon knows all. King Solomon says, the, oh, you have a question? If you know. It's on, it's on. If you know all, then who's leading Sunday school? Who is what? Who's leading Sunday school? Oh, King Solomon knows who leads. And there's two new leaders in our Sunday school this morning. One is this gentleman here, Rick Farias. Say hi to the people. <laughs> first time, first time leading, by the way. Sunday school. No, it's not. Oh, it's not? Oh, in my, in my time here is your first time. OK, and Jesse Fisher. He's in the back there. Jesse Fisher is our other leader. 
King Solomon knows all. Yes, indeed. And King Solomon says, iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens another. Now, what does that mean? Iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens another person. Hmm? You know what that means? W one person can make another person better. Yes, exactly. Good job, Sullivan. Very good job. And with that being said, you guys are going to go to class now together, and you're going to make each other better in your Sunday school along with your teachers. You're even going to make your teachers better. So let's stand up, everybody. Let's head on our way out there. Thank you for joining King Solomon on this day. You're welcome. Have a joyful class, everybody. And let's all stand together and sing. Let us now share our faith in the words of the 2022 Confirmation Class Creed. We believe God is love. Jesus is God's love in human form. And the Holy Spirit is the energy of the love of God in our souls. Even though God is hard to fathom, we believe God is always by our side and always supports us. We believe we encounter who God is in creation, in the Holy Scriptures, and in Jesus Christ. God can also be seen and shown to us through others, through people in need and when people help us. We believe God is powerful and inspires awe, and God creates, sustains, and redeems creation. We believe God is gracious and merciful, inspires love in our hearts, and moves us to care for others unselfishly so that all people can experience the fullness of life. Amen. We gather today to worship the one who created us, the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. With joyful hearts, let us worship God.
seated for our readings and keep those bulletins because they will be responsively read this morning. Good morning. Scripture reading is from Jonah 3, 10 and through 4, 11. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was not very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said would I will still while I was still in my own country. This is why I fled to Tarish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, it is right for you to be angry. Is it right for you to be angry? Oops. Jonah went out to the city, sat down east of the city, and made a booth for himself. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord appointed a bush, made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. So when Jonah came up in the day, God appointed a worm that, that attacked the bush, so it, it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor, which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. chose me has always been a mystery all my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite with all the never get it right but it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. And ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. had stage fright and David brought a rock to a sword fight you picked 12 outsiders nobody would have chosen and you changed the world well the moral of the story is everybody's got a purpose so when I hear the devil start talking to me saying who do you just a nobody trying to tell everybody well all about somebody who saved my soul ever since you rescued me you gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see nobody but she
The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 20th chapter, also read responsively. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went away and went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. God's kingdom is so unfair. God's kingdom is very, very unfair. Not, of course, like the kingdoms of the earth, right? Those are very fair. We get exactly what we deserve in our kingdoms of the earth. Apparently, grace is just not fair. But maybe there's a different type of justice at work here that is foreign to us, that we don't really understand, and that's what Jesus came to teach us all about. What is God's fairness? We see in this reading that the people were standing idly around, right? He came back, 9 o'clock, people are still standing there waiting to get some work. It says they were idle. Then he comes back at 12 o'clock, there's more people, and they're still standing there waiting to get work. They're standling, stand, standling? They are standing idly by, even at 5 o'clock, still waiting for the hope that they could find some decent work some decent employment for that day. And that word idle has a lot of connotations, right? It can mean lazy, can mean unprofitable, injurious, thoughtless even. There's a lot of negativity around that word idle. But what is really going on here? Are they the ones to blame for that situation that they're standing idly around? What do you think? It's just a part of the deal. They just working day to day. I'm sure you can think of people in our society today that are working day to day, just hoping to get some work for that day so that they can then make it to the next day, hoping for some decent employment so that they can provide for themselves and their families. They obviously wanted to work why else would they still be standing there at 5 o'clock in the evening, 
hoping to make some money. They wanted to work, but nobody had hired them. And I think we know that if you have a lot of people waiting around to get decent employment, to make a living, and they're not getting hired, it's not good for them, and it's not good for the totality of our society either. Read a, uh, I listened actually to an interesting book. I had a long, long drive during this summer, and so we put on a book to listen to in the car. It's called The Four Winds, and I cannot remember the author of this book. Kristen Hanna, the author of The Four Winds. It's a really interesting story about a family in the Great Depression, and they're living in Texas, and then their farm gets hit in the Dust Bowl, and they're not able to grow any crops for years and years, and they're struggling and struggling, and finally the father leaves to go off wherever and try and find some employment, and the mom has these kids, and they end up leaving Texas to go to California, the land of milk and honey, right? The promised land, they're gonna go to California, and they struggle to get there, and they find they get to the San Joaquin Valley. It's beautiful, it's green, but things don't get better than them, for, for them. They find out they're not the only ones who have come out to California. There's thousands and thousands of people coming to California looking to find work, and then they end up living in this like encampment with, all the, with a few hundred other people, um, and they're trying to find work every single day. The mom has to go out and try and find work. She has to get up at four o'clock in the morning, go out to a farm. If they're lucky, she'll get work for that day and they'll be able to have food, they'll be able to be provided for. But how do you think the people of California reacted to all these people coming from the Midwest during the Great Depression? What was their general reaction to people coming out? They, yeah, well, what are you doing here? This is not your land, this is our land. You don't belong here, you should just go back. And they call them all Okies, even if they weren't from Oklahoma. Everybody was an Okie, right? They didn't like them. They treated them with hatred, basically. They had prejudice against them. They didn't want to help these people who were trying to find decent employment and provide for their families. They thought they're a drain on the system because after being there for a year, they could get aid from the state government. So they would put, they would go and check in, you know, the first day getting there, they were told to go sign themselves up and a year later they would start getting aid. They could get aid from the federal government as well, a little bit of food, a little bit of help along the way, but they were seen as a drain on the system the people did not want them in California. Do we get jealous or envious when other people receive help, when they receive what they need? Does that make us jealous of what they get? Even if we have enough, right? Even if we have enough for ourselves, we still tend to get jealous. We want to hold on. We want to keep them away because they are not a part of our group. They're not a part of our community, right? They're not one of us. So we feel prejudice. We feel entitled to what we have, right? It's ours. We worked hard for it. We worked hard for what we have. And it shouldn't just be given away to anybody else. It is not fair, right? It is not fair. Do we get jealous when God gives to somebody else? When God wants to help somebody who is in need, does that make us jealous? We've been working in your kingdom, God, our whole lives, grew up in the church, been a devoted follower all my life, but why are you helping somebody else more than me? I deserve more, God. I deserve more. God says, why are you upset that I am generous? Why does that make you upset if I'm generous with somebody else? I promised you the reward that you are going to get and you are going to get that reward and I can do whatever I want and give anything to anybody else that I choose to do so. Why are you upset that God is good? Why are we upset that God is good? 
that God is upright, that God is honorable, that God's justice is beyond what we can truly even imagine that justice to be. Just this last Friday was the um, anniversary of the initial declaration, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation that Abraham Lincoln put out. It happened on this last Friday. That was the date. And then, of course, it actually took effect and he made the official announcement in January. And this was the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all the slaves who were in this country at the time. But it really upset a lot of people, didn't it? We look back in that history, it was upsetting. They are going to take what is ours. This is our land, even though... You know, we got it from the Native American people that we pushed them off the land, but it's ours now, and we lay claim to this land. And so we cannot free the slaves because, one, their property, what's going to happen, that's a lot of wealth that's going to be lost, and people got really, really upset. Of course, they chose to make the announcement after the, the Union Army had won a big battle, right? So they had more people on their side, and then it actually worked out favorably for them because... France and Britain then could not recognize the southern states who they kind of wanted to be allied with a little bit. It was helpful for their trade because all the cotton, of course, was coming from there into these other countries. But when they, the Union said no slavery, then they came to our side. So there's political reasons for that. But it made people jealous. It made people envious. Like somehow they were going to take what was theirs for themselves, and I am not going to have what is mine. I am not going to have enough. Maybe this applies to the church also. I mean, look, you know, who has been member here since the beginning? Do we have, uh, I think, Greg Nolan? He's our guy back there. Greg Nolan, charter member. How old were you when, when you signed that document? Did you know what you were signing? Oh, okay. So yeah, you were you were good. You were a good age, 16. Uh, the, and then we have, I think there's only one other charter member still, Greg Nolan and one other. And you've been here since the beginning in this church. And maybe others have been here a long time, a part of St. Paul. And then somebody new comes in and they start taking leadership and start saying, maybe we should do things a little differently. How does that make you feel? Somebody new comes in and they're like, Hey, we should switch this up. We should do something different. We should evangelize differently. We should do our stewardship, our community outreach, whatever it is. We should have some new ideas. How does that make you feel? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it does not make you feel good. You're like, I'm just happy somebody's here taking some leadership, right? <laughs> Somebody please take some leadership. Well... But it can happen <laughs> where we want to hold on to the church, right? We want to hold on to what's ours. We want to hold on to the kingdom of God. We want to hold on to God's blessings, to God's rewards for us. And it may feel like if other people are getting those rewards, somehow it means less for us. But God says you should be happy. I promised you this reward, which pretty good reward if you ask me you know eternal life the continuation of our souls into eternal life pretty good reward if you ask me and that's what God has promised to us and God knows what we deserve that should be enough for us as followers of God and not to expect anymore there's one guy in history who took this to the limit his name was Constantine and if you know about Constantine, he waited to get baptized till he was about to die because he thought, for sure, I'm going to go straight to heaven, right? If I'm cleaned, all my sin is washed away from me, and then I die right away, I'm going right to heaven. He wanted that reward from God, so he waited even to get baptized. Was he welcomed into the kingdom of heaven? Maybe we don't want him to be. <laughs> That's not fair. I was baptized as an infant. I've been having to deal with this repentance thing my whole life. And he comes along and gets baptized at the last minute? It's not really fair. It's not really up to us either, is it? 
Look at what happened to Jonah. We just read that story. He had to go tell the people of Nineveh to repent. He did not want to do that. One, Nineveh was the capital of the kingdom of Assyria. They attacked the people of Israel, took over the northern kingdom. They were enemies. They were enemies. But Jonah was called to bring them to repentance, and he didn't want to do so. He begrudgingly did it, of course. He spent three days in the the stomach of a fish and all of that. We know that whole story. And he went and finally did it, but he secretly hoped that they wouldn't repent. He secretly hoped that they would not receive the message. And then here he is later in the story, so petty, right? He's like got this bush that dies, and he's like, just kill me now. Just kill me now over this bush. We can be petty like Jonah sometimes. We can hold on to grudges so that we don't fully welcome everybody into our communities and into our church community and into the community of our nation, into the community here in Fullerton and Orange County. We can hold on to these grudges, even sometimes in our church. But God is not petty. God loves all the nations. God wants all people to turn from evil and sin and to believe in him. God wants all the people who are working day to day to provide for their families. God wants all the upper management people to be welcomed into the kingdom, even the latecomers to the church. Wait their whole lives and finally come and join the kingdom of God. He wants all people to be welcomed into this faithful community in Jesus Christ. And God wants us to care for all people without prejudice, to find ways to care for others who are in need, even strangers, even our enemies who are in need. We are called to reach out to them, to the ones who live in far off lands like Jonah and the Ninevites. That is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. It's radical, it doesn't seem right, it doesn't seem fair, but it's true. That is the kingdom of God, and that's what we are called to be here in this world, a part of that unfair kingdom of heaven. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. Let's stand up and sing together.
I invite you to kneel or be seated as you are able for the prayers. Holy One, we believe that we were created in love. Yet when we face ourselves in the mirror, too often we do not see love. For our prejudice, for our hatred, for our pride, for our apathy, for our cruelty, for our blindness. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy One, we believe we are created in your image. But when we look in the mirror, we do not see anything good. For our hollow sense of self, for our inflated ego, for our inner critic, for our needless stoicism, for our sense of worthlessness, for our inability to see ourselves as beloved. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy One, we believe we are called to see the face of Christ in all, but we refuse to see Christ in some, for holding on to old resentments, for calling another enemy, for allowing the color of one's skin to influence us, for negating the other names by which you are called, for seeing borders as fences and not invitations to exploration, for not living the truth that the whole world is in your hands. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Wonderful God, God of laughter and promises, source of joy and source of hope, hear our prayers. In the calm of this beautiful space, we are mindful of those who do not know the beauty of friendship and community, the calm of daily bread, the peace of life without violence of war. So we lift up to you those people around the world who suffer this day, the poor, the hungry, those facing rampant disease. We lift up to you those places torn apart by war and conflict and by natural disaster, as if we need to lift them up to you. You are already there, compassionate and strong. Help us to follow your example, and to help us, we can. In the calm of this beautiful space, we are mindful of those in our community who are racked with worry and anxiety about their health, of the health of those they love about work and finances, about their kids' well-being and their education and their social lives and their education. We lift up to you all those who are anxious about so much as if we need to lift them up to you. You are already with them, the still small voice in the midst of the storm reminding them to breathe and to trust. In the calm of this beautiful space, we give you thanks for this time, for this time set apart to worship. We lift up to you all our praise for the good in life and for the struggles that help us to grow. We lift up to you that which we cannot name aloud. We lift up to you our hearts, knowing that you have had them all along. We offer our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us stand and share a sign of that peace with one another.
Uh, we want to say thank you so much to Greg and Jackie Nolan for the flowers in honor of Brixton's second birthday. And then also thank you to Kathy Peters um, in honor of Caitlin, Lauren, and Doug Strom's mutual birthdays. And I uh, see that Doug Strom is here with us this morning. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. And many blessings. Always good to see you here in church. Does anybody else have a birthday going on? No? Okay, okay. Very good. No, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Passed along. <laughs> I had a birthday this on Tuesday. Tuesday, yes. Thank you. <laughs> One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Doug Straw. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And I'd like to say, I think Damaris is happy because I finally caught up to her in age. So another seven months to go before you surpass me. Okay, uh, uh, more announcements this morning. We are continuing our book study. This Wednesday is the second part of a two-part book study. It's on Zoom. We have more copies of the book. It's a real short book, but it's very good. Uh, so grab a, a copy of that on your way out. You can read it in less than an hour. So grab a copy of that um, and read that, and then we'll send out a Zoom link for that uh, book study that'll be Wednesday at 7 p.m. That will be continuing the book study. And it's about stewardship. It's about giving our lives to God and what that means. So, so please join us for that if you're able. And then next Sunday, we're having our joint worship service with the Good Village Church. It will be bilingual, English and Korean, and it will be at 10 a.m. So we're moving it just 30 minutes later. We're going to start at 10 a.m. And then members of the congregation have been planning uh, a potluck afterwards. So we're going to stay and we're going to serve the Good Village Church as they served us with uh, Korean barbecue back in the spring. So we, we want to share in that hospitality with them. So please come and support and be a part of that day of fellowship with our fellow Christians at the Good Village Church. And then coming up in um, October, we have our stewardship series, which is gonna be three weeks, October 8th to the 22nd. We're gonna have guest people coming to share about local ministries from OC United, Pathways of Hope, and Crittenton each Sunday with a temple talk. And on the 8th, we're gonna have a special workshop uh, with Lisa Higginbotham, who's leading our stewardship book study and is also going to be joining us in doing a workshop about estate planning. And then on the following Sunday after that, our very own Pearl Mann is going to be giving a workshop as well and preparing a trust and other end of life things. So, so there's going to be multiple workshops, ways to get involved, and lots going on during worship those three weeks. And then we're going to have Reformation Sunday at the very end. And we have one confirmand this year. Weber Warden is going to be leading us. So please put that on your calendars um, October 29th to come and support Weber when he affirms his faith that morning. And then one last announcement that I have is the 21st of October is the Look Who's Dancing competition. It's the fundraiser for Pathways of Hope. The Prestons hosted a fundraising party yesterday. If you weren't able to make that, there's of course still time to give, to donate, and support Pathways of Hope. Um, and there are flyers on your way out. You can take a flyer, you can give that to a friend. Make sure you get tickets, go to the event on October 1st. I'm gonna be dancing it up, gonna be dancing a storm, doing some cumbias up there, you know, we're gonna, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, maybe even a little hip hop thrown in. It'll be really fun. And there's four other dancers who are gonna be awesome also. Not quite as good, but they'll be amazing as well. So <laughs> come join us on the 21st, grab a flyer and donate. Yes. 
Thank you. Flu clinic is coming up. It'll be uh, in the morning and then in a little ways into the afternoon, right? On that, it's a Sunday morning. So sign up for that. And then there's a place to put, like if you're over 65, because there's different flu shots. So make sure you, you put that information on there as well. There's a sign up as you're leaving. Other announcements? Am I missing anything? Yes, thank you all. You were awesome. Uh, thank you all who have donated so far. We even had an anonymous donor of $5,000, a matching donation, and many have given uh, hundreds, so we're doing, we're doing really well. We're ho I don't know if we'll catch up to Nick's last year. That was, that was like out of this world, but we're, we're hoping to be able to get close to that. Um, so thank you all for your support in that. And thank you, Joyce. This coming Saturday is our memorial service for Marge Young. It'll be at 11 a.m. So please come and um, celebrate her life with us and with her family. And there'll be a reception following that service. Any other announcements? So uh, Barbara Swanberg's memorial service is going to be the 28th of October. Same time, 11 a.m. And so please put that on your calendars. Come and celebrate her life as well on the 28th here in the sanctuary. Okay. Any other? All right. Let's stand up as we're able and receive this blessing. Know that God goes with us, the Father who creates us and cares for us with a mother's tenderness, the Son who guides us along paths of light, grace, and truth, and the Spirit who inspires and empowers us in love. May we be blessed as we seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Amen. Go in peace, love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.